digest, uh, digestive system. Last time we stopped, I think here in the gastric mucosa. So gastric mucosa and uh, hydrochloric acid secretion. We'll finish this and then we'll start part two. So if you see stomach mucosa, that is called gastric gland because they have cells which secrete enzymes and hormones, okay? So it has mucus cell, parietal cell, cheap cells, and they have their functions. So let's go here. The gastric gland contains cells that secrete different products that form gastric juice. So gastric, if you take gastric juice, you're gonna see a lot of stuff. The most important part of the juice is low pH, which is around less than two pH or 1.8. And that's are due to the cells in the epithelium, okay? So here in the gastric gland, we have cheap cells, parietal cells, mucus cells, and some other cells. Cheap cells produce pepsinogen, secrete pep pepsinogen. This pepsinogen is precursor of pepsin. That means pepsinogen convert into pepsin by uh, pepsin and hydrochloric acid. The parietal cells produce HCL an intrinsic factor. HCL helps in digestion of protein, kills microorganism, whereas intrinsic factor is necessary for absorption of vitamin B12 from your intestine. Whereas the goblet cells or mucus cells produce mucus. And that mucus are bicarbonate rich, which covers the epithelium to protect the gastric mucosa. There is another cells, it's called ECL cells, enterochromaffin-like cells that produce histamine and serotonin. Histamine activate parietal cells to produce more secrete more uh, hydrochloric acid. Then G cells secrete gastrin. Gastrin also activate parietal cells indirectly and produce more uh, the, the hydrochloric acid. D cells secrete somatostatin, which inhibit the parietal cells and reduce the secretion of hydrochloric acid. So how these parietal cells secrete acid then. So let's see, this is the connective tissue basement membrane. And then this is the cell and this is gastric lumen. So how these cells secrete hydrochloric acid? So th this side, we have a blood vessel here and this is the lumen, this is the parietal cell. So let's go to parietal cells now. So this is blood vessel, blood capillaries and here is lumen of the stomach, and these are the epithelial cells and other cells of the gastric mucosa. So is here hydrochloric acid producing cells, the parietal cells. So parietal cells like other cells have enzyme called CA, carbonic and hydrogen enzyme, that catalyze carbon dioxide and water and forms carbonic acid and then carbonic acid further divided by the same enzyme into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ions, okay? Now, this bicarbonate ion, hydrogen ion is built up in the cell. So once hydrogen ion is here, build up, that hydrogen ion is transported outside of this cell in exchange for potassium ion because one positive going out, another is coming in with the active, primary active transport, which uses ATPH enzyme, okay? To produce energy. So uh, hydrogen is secreted into your lumen. Then this is bicarbonate negative ion. So this negative ion through the secondary active transport is exchanged with the chloride and chloride is built up in the cell and then chloride by facilitate diffusion through chloride channel, they come into the lumen and they form out limitly the hydrochloric acid, okay? 
So this is called, this pump is called proton pump. This pump is called proton pump. Uh, you have heard about the proton pump inhibitor medicine, proton pump inhibitor. Inhibitor that is called Prilosec. So, Prilosec is the market name of the medication, but basically they are Omeprazole. Omeprazole is the real medicine. Omeprazole, Pentoprazole, Lisinoprazole. There are several prazoles, those are the proton pump inhibitor. So when let's say you have gastritis and your stomach is producing a lot of acid that is giving burning sensation and ulcer of your stomach. In that case, we take prilosec. Prilosec binds with this pump and inhibit the hydrogen pump. So hydrogen is not coming here and you are not producing a lot of acid. Okay. So, uh, hydrochloric acid is secreted in response to hormone gastrin and stimulation of parasympathetic nervous system, particularly the acetylcholine from vagus nerve. And these are indirect effect because they stimulate release of histamine, which cause parietal cells to secrete HCL. So when parasympathetic stimulation that activates the release of acetylcholine through the vagus nerve. That activates the uh, histamine as well as the parietal cells. So parietal cells directly produce more hydrochloric acid and histamine indirectly activate parietal cells to produce. So both way, the hormone gastrin and acetylcholine increase hydrochloric acid secretion by the parietal cells. HCL in the stomach. So HCL is like the very strong acid. The, if you take a spoonful of acid and you put it on your palm, your palm gonna burn. But you can see with that low uh, pH, the stomach epitheliums are not burned because there is several protection, okay? So we will talk about that. What are the protection which protects? But let's talk about some digestion in the stomach. The main digestion in the stomach is uh, the protein digestion. So when you take protein, ingested protein, is turned into short peptide. Not like you, you don't release amino acid, the ultimate product of the protein. You break down some level. So the cheap cell produce pepsinogen and then pepsinogen with the help of hydrochloric acid is converted into pepsin. This pepsin also converts pepsinogen into pepsin. And this is like a positive mechanism, positive feedback mechanism. This pepsin then digest ingested protein into short peptide, not into the free amino acid. Then the short peptides pass down to the small intestine and further digested. So both HCL and pepsin, pepsin is also very acidic and it can damage stomach lining and can cause ulcer of the stomach and initial part of the duodenum because the stomach content also passes to the duodenum. So there is several defense. The first line of defense is the adherent layer of the mucus. You know there was mucus cell or goblet cell producing mucus and that mucus contains a lot of bicarbonate. So when they make mucin protein, they also add some bicarbonate and make it alkaline. And that is a stable gel of mucus which coats the gastric epithelium. That's why a seed is not entering through that adherent layer of mucus and hit the cell. This contains bicarbonate for neutralizing HCL is a barrier 
of, uh, to action of the pepsin. Pepsin is also very acidic pepsin enzyme and it cannot pass through that layer. Another protection is the gastric epithelial cells. Each epithelial cells, let's see this is the gastric epithelial cells. They are attached to each other by a junction. That junction is called tight junction and tight junction does not allow anything to enter inside the cell so it can damage the cell, okay? Gastric epithelial cells are replaced every three days, like in 72 hours. So if there is damage, they have a higher rate of meta, uh, the, the mitosis, that's why they are replaced easily, okay? Digestion and absorption of stomach. Stomach digests protein and there is only absorption of the, uh, some alcohol, water, and aspirin. Aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid. Okay. If somehow, if there is breach of the epithelium of stomach or duodenum, and that breach or wound is called ulcers, and it is associated with pepsin, so we call them peptic ulcer or gastric ulcer. So peptic ulcers are erosion of mucous membrane of stomach or duodenum caused by action of the HCL and pepsin. But how we produce more HCL? Because if we activate HCL producing cell, which is the, uh, the, the parietal cells, okay? So, or if there is a cell which is producing a lot of gastrin, or if there is a cell which is causing a lot of release of acetylcholine, then we produce a lot of HCL. So there is a syndrome called Jollinger, Jollinger Ellison syndrome. This is a kind of tumor of gastrin producing cells. So gastrin producing cells, tumor is called Jollinger Ellison syndrome. And if there is a lot of gastrin, that means that will activate the parietal cell to produce more acid and then more acid will cause ulcer of the gastric tract. And that is called Jollinger Ellison syndrome ulcer. Another most common cause of ulcer in the stomach is H. pylori. This is a kind of gram negative bacteria which cause infection and that breach the epithelium and cause cancer, uh, the ulcer. This is treated with, that's why the triple therapy we call the, we, are, we treat helicobacter infection with antibiotics and some proton pump inhibitor like Prilosec. Some acute gastritis means very fresh gastritis, which has happens within 72 hours is an inflammation that result from damage by acid. For example, if you are under stress in such a, like certain, certain time when you have very near and dear death in the family or some stif, stressful condition. In that case, under the stress, you produce a lot of acid and that can cause gastritis. That is called acute gastritis. In burn patient, when is a burn, these patients are admitted in burn unit and they usually get acute gastritis, okay? So these are the ulcers and the treatment of the ulcer in the first part. So we're gonna go here and then go to next. Yeah, so the second part of the digestive system. Today, in the second part, we will talk about down below the stomach. So we'll talk about a small intestine, large intestine, anal region, and then the accessory organs of the digestive system like salivary glands, pancreas, liver, gallbladder, okay? So here, the learning outcome for today's uh, lecture is 
to describe the structure and function of the small intestine, what is the structure and function, to identify the location and describe the function of digestive enzyme of small intestine. So here, make sure you understand that. In the small intestine, there is two kinds of enzymes. One is enzyme coming from outside, like coming from pancreas. And another source of enzymes are enzymes attached to the epithelium of the, stoma, the small intestine. Particularly the enzymes attached to the microvilli of the small intestine. And that is, that's why we call them brass border enzymes, okay? Then describe the function and structure of the liver, gallbladder, then we will talk about synthesis, composition, and function of the bile, which is coming from your liver. And then composition of pancreatic juice. And then what is the significance of pancreatic enzymes in the digestion? Okay, so clinical case for today is Frank, a 30-year-old Asian graduate student had been experiencing occasional discomfort after meals. So it is Asian. 30 year young male, and there is occasional discomfort after meals. Occasional, only sometime, not every day. So let's see when it happens. The discomfort reached a peak, new peak last night after about two hours of eating a cheeseburger and a large chocolate milkshake. So here, dairy product is going inside now. He had also abdominal pain, cramps, and diarrhea. That means whatever he has eaten has not been absorbed. On examination by a doctor, he was found dehydrated and weak. Explain the diagnosis, cause, and pathophysiology of the disease. Looking at this clinical case, what kind of clinical case you think this is? Possibly lactose intolerance, a lot yes, of milk going this, on. This is lactose intolerance, and we'll see what happens in lactose intolerance, okay? So small intestine start from the stomach, pyloric sphincter, and then there is first part duodenum, then jejunum and ileum. And if you, small intestine is the longest part of GI tract. It is approximately three meter long the smallest among those three part is the duodenum, first part, which is only one 25 centimeter long. Jejunum is two fifth and ileum is three fifth of the length. So total three meter of the length. Small intestine is the largest, is the longest organ in length in GI tract. It is a small intestine, but its length is the longest, but its diameter is less than, sorry, large intestine. So we call it small intestine. Small intestine is the main site of digestion and absorption. And to absorb, you need a big area, large area. That's why if you see the histology of the small intestine, there is several anatomical mechanism to increase the surface area. So here, in folding of the mucosa and submucosa, we have plica circularis. And on the plica circularis, there is infolding of the epithelium. That is called velus, which increases further surface area. And if you see a velus, then if epithelial cells of the velus plasma membrane, epical plasma membrane, is also infolded, and that is called microvelus. So these all increase the surface area of this small intestine. So there are four mechanisms which increase surface area in the small intestine. One, long length of a small intestine. Second, plica circularis. Third, velus. Fourth, microvelus. So in the exam, if I ask which one of the following is not the structure which increase the surface area of the small intestine, you need to know. Okay. So if you see a velus, what do you see? The same thing, epithelium, goblet cells, simple columnar objective epithelium, goblet cells, and then you have central lacteals, 
and then blood vessels. These capillaries absorb protein and carb, whereas these lacteal absorb fat. And then you see, this is the intestinal crypt and the cells around the interstitial, uh, intestinal crypt are the cell of liver con, crypt of liver con. These cells replace when these cells die, simple columnar or other cells die, then this is the cells which divide by mitosis and replace them every 72 hours. So the a carpet like uh, a carpet of hair like microvilli project from apical surface of each epithelial cell. So the microvilli are enfolding of the plasma membrane of epithelial cells. And they look like carpet. That's why we call them brush border. And on that brush border, there are enzymes attached and that is called brush border enzymes. So I want to show you here, let's see here. So if it is, one epithelial cells, if I magnify it, here this cell and the apical surface is this one. So I'm gonna increase the surface area of this cell. So these are called microvilli, MB. And on this microvilli, you have enzymes attached to it. enzymes attached to it, the blue. These enzymes are called brush border enzyme. That means every food molecule needs to come in contact with because these enzymes are not getting inside, mixing with the fluid inside the lumen. Are you following me? So when the enzyme comes from pancreas, they are mixing with the fluid in the intestine, but these enzymes are attached to the microvilli. They are not in the liquid. That means to be digested, a molecule must come to the epithelium. That's why mixing of the small intestine is important so that all molecules ultimately comes here. Okay. So these brush border enzymes are active sites are exposed to chyme of these enzymes. And here is the enzymes. the list of the enzymes. Those enzymes are three categories major. Disaccharides means they digest disaccharides, means double molecule, joint molecule of sugar. They have also protein digesting enzyme that is called peptidase, and they have phosphate releasing enzyme, we call them phosphatase. So disaccharides is sucrase, maltase, lactase. Sucrase digests sucrose to glucose and fructose. So this is like if you have sugar from the fruit, which is sucrase, sucrose. Like your table sugar, when you take a spoonful of sugar, that is sucrose. And they are double chain of sugar. And that sucrose is digested by this sucrase enzyme, which is found on the breast border and make glucose and fructose. And if you have deficiency, then you will have fructose intolerance. Similarly, maltase digest maltose to two molecules of glucose. Lactase digest lactose to glucose and galactose. These two are simple sugar. And deficiency of this lactase will keep the lactose inside your small intestine. And then it pass down to the small intestine undigested, uh, to the large intestine undigested. In the large intestine you have, in the large intestine you have a lot of bacteria and those bacteria have their own enzymes. So they break down that lactose, but it does not make glucose and galactose. They make something else and that increase the osmolality of your large intestine, absorb a lot of water, produce gas, and that gives you abdominal discomfort and distension, okay? 
Similarly, there is peptidase enzyme like aminopeptidase, enterokinidase, and they all digest protein. And then phosphatase like calcium, magnesium, ATPase, and alkaline phosphatase, they all break down the, uh, the, the, uh, the dietary calcium, like where you eat calcium from the milk and other source. They remove this calcium, magnesium, and removes also phosphate group from organic molecules like your meat, fish, and other source, okay? Now in the intestine, you have peristalsis and segmentation, you know. Peristalsis is like the wave of contraction. So you have peristalsis is, let's see if this is your GI tract. Here is contraction and here is relaxation. Then this is contraction, here is relaxation. Here is contraction, then relaxation. So you, you are pretty much squeezing the content. But segmentation, you can see segmentation here. Segmentation is like two points are contracting at once. You see here? So when you contract, what happens? You are mixing inside content here. And then in the next stage, what happens? Relaxing part is contracting and contracting part is relaxing. So you are mixing mixed part with the non-mixed part. And that's how you are mixing the things. So the function of segmentation is mixing. Now, large intestine. So before we go to large intestine, we're gonna talk about digestion and absorption. And that is coming next. So in the small intestine, you got the Enzymes from the breast border enzyme. You have enzymes from the pancreas, like salivary, uh, the pancreatic amylase, uh, trypsin, chymotrypsin, peptidase, uh, then uh, pancreatic amylase, lipase, elastase, and bile from the gallbladder. All comes in your small intestine and digest, and then it absorbs. Okay, so now large intestine is large because its diameter is large. It extends from the ileocecal valve, which is here, and the first part is cecum, and then there is appendix, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon. And there is pouch coming out of the wall, and that is called a hostrum, and pleura is hostra, okay? So outer surface bulge from the uh, pouches that is called hostra, and these hostra contract because they have muscle, and that gives mass effect on the feces, which is found here in the large intestine. So chyme, which is coming from this, uh, the small intestine enters cecum and then passes through ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon, and ultimately in the anal canal. This is rectum where, when the feces comes, that gives stretch to the wall, and then autonomic stretch further brings the stretch to the internal anal sphincter. Internal anal sphincter is made up of a smooth muscle and a stretch in it takes the sensory impulse to your brain and a spinal cord. And in the spinal cord, you see the reflex and then it goes to brain. From the brain, you now look for restroom. And if there is no restroom, then what happens? You have another external sphincter, which is controlled by your frontal cortex, which is voluntary. So you constrict till you find the privacy of restroom. And once you find the restroom, then you relax external sphincter and internal is already relaxed. That causes defecation. Okay. So large intestine has no digestive function. Pretty much it does not digest anything but it absorbs water, some electrolytes like uh, the, the bicarbonate, calcium, potassium. They also synthesize some B and K vitamins and folic acid. Uh, they have no villi, no crypts, and not very like the, like the small intestine. But the most important part, it has microflora of microorganism. And there are like several kinds of gram-negative bacteria. These bacteria are good bacteria. That's why we call them commensal bacteria because this bacteria only feeds on the waste coming from our digestive tract and prevent 
any bacteria from getting bad bacteria, which can cause infection, okay? So these 10 to the power 13, like trillion commensal bacteria of 400 species. They produce folic acid, vitamin K and ferment in digestible food to produce fatty acid and some other gases. And they reduce the function of pathogenic microorganism, okay? So when you have like minor infection, viral infection where you don't need antibiotics and you take, sometimes doctors prescribe just for safe side. In that case, those antibiotics kill these normal flora and that will give chance to the other pathogenic bacteria to cause infection, which is not good. So you should not be using indiscriminate micro, uh, the, the antibiotics, okay? Most of the water and food is absorbed by your small intestine. Almost 90% of whatever you drink is absorbed by small intestine. Whatever passes to the large intestine, large intestine absorb 90% of that. Listen to me again. Whatever you drink and eat, if you have H2O water, 90% of that is absorbed till you reach your small intestine. Some you absorb into your stomach and some in your small intestine. And then whatever 10% pass to the large intestine, 90% of that 10% is absorbed into large intestine based on what is your hydration status, okay? And rest passes in stool as defecation. So let's see if you have drank one liter of water, which is 1000 ml, almost 900 ml will be absorbed by the time it reaches your small intestine. 100 ml will pass to large intestine. Out of that 100 ml, again, 90 ml will be absorbed and only 10 ml will pass down in his stool, okay? So absorption of water is, begins with the osmotic gradient set up by sodium potassium pump. So sodium potassium pump, you know, they act with the hormone aldosterone. Do you remember kidney aldosterone in early uh, cortical collecting duct and late uh, the distal convoluted tubule? There is aldosterone which absorbs sodium with exchange for potassium. So the same thing here too. And then sodium is high outside the intestine. So you absorb water there. Okay, because water follows by osmosis. Salt and water reabsorption is stimulated by aldosterone. Large intestine can also secrete water via active transport sodium chloride into intestinal lumen. So if you like, if you are like less water drinker, then still you need to pass soft stool. You cannot pass the pellets. And to make soft your stool, your intestine in that case reverse. They bring water from your blood and put into your stool and make you thirsty so you drink and make your stool soft. Okay, now let's talk about some of the accessory organs of the digestive system. So what are the accessory organs of the digestive system from mouth to anus? Um, the salivary glands, teeth, teeth, uh, teeth. Uh -huh. Pancreas. Uh, mm -hmm. Liver is one of them. Gallbladder. Gallbladder. Okay. So liver, the largest gland in the body. Okay. It is the largest interest internal organ. Before we go over histology, do we have, let's talk about here, the structure of the liver. So liver lies in the right side of your upper part of your abdomen, just under the diaphragm. And it has two larger lobes, this one, right lobe, left lobe, and two smaller lobe. Caudate lobe and quadrate lobe, okay? What does liver do? First, let's talk about the liver. So liver, 
get blood from your intestine, venous blood from your intestine, which are rich in nutrients, electrolytes. And liver also get oxygen rich blood, arterial blood from abdominal aorta. So both portal vein and hepatic artery enter the liver. Okay. And then because the blood is coming from the intestine that contains a lot of nutrients. So liver modified and then blood mixing arterial and venous blood mix, they form the sinusoids and then drain blood again back through the, through the hepatic vein, which is not here and join the inferior vena cava. Okay, so you see hepatic portal vein is taking blood to the liver and then through the hepatic vein, it takes to the inferior vena cava. At the same time, liver also makes bile, the liver cells, and that is drained through the right and left hepatic duct, common hepatic duct, join the cystic duct, and then bile comes in the gallbladder. When you eat fatty food, then gallbladder constrict, and then it passes through the common bile duct into the small intestine. Okay. So let's see the histology of liver. So liver is made up of several lobules. So liver is made up of, if you take liver, the liver has lobes and inside the lobe you have small lobules, small levers. And each lobule is hexagonal in structure. They have six sides. Okay, they have six sides. In this diagram, we can see only two sides and two angles. So if you have hexagonal structure, let's see if we have hexagonal structure, what happens? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six angle and six side in each lobule. So from each angle, you see, these structure enter and exit the lever. So what is entering? branch of hepatic portal vein. Where does this branch of hepatic portal vein come from? Come on, where did this come from? Did you say the abdominal aorta? It comes from the hepatic oh, intestine. Oh, sorry. Portal veins are formed by union of veins from the wall of your small intestine and lower part of the stomach and some upper part of the large intestine. Those are the veins. So small capillary joints, venules joints and forms the vein. And that is bringing because they have absorbed protein and carb and that blood is entering. You see, they enter and pass through in between the plate of liver cells. So that is branch of hepatic portal vein. Then branch of hepatic artery, which is the branch of aorta. This is carrying red oxygenated blood. And when they also enter through the veins, they become sinusoids. They form hepatic sinusoids. And these hepatic sinusoids cells have holes. So like usually cells plasma membrane has no holes, but in these cells there is holes. So what happens? All the nutrients, let's see if it is carrying amino acid and glucose this glucose will pass from these holes and go to these cells, hepatocytes, and these hepatocytes, if you have eaten a lot of glucose, then join them and forms the glycogen and store them, for example. Similarly, if you have a lot of fat, then these cell will make cholesterol and store inside the cell or send to the blood. And then 
these cells also, hepatocyte, liver cell also makes bile. That's bile duct, bile then enter small ductules, and then it joins the bile duct, which is coming out of the liver. These three structure, branch of hepatic portal vein, branch of hepatic artery, and the bile ductil together is called portal triad. And how many portal triad you will have in each lobule of the liver? Six. Six, yes. And then blood drain from here in the central vein. Central veins will be in the center here. And that central vein ultimately joins the hepatic okay. vein, hepatic vein. And then hepatic vein joins the inferior vena cava, okay? In this uh, <clears throat> sinusoids in the wall here, you have some phagocytic cells that is called cuffer cells. So if there is any toxic substance from GI tract coming here, they're gonna eat them up. So that is the liver. Uh, this liver is highly dynamic organ. Let's see, in an accident, you have damaged almost like two thirds of your liver, almost 75% of your liver. It is damaged and doctor needs to cut all the liver and take it out. And you have healthy, normal 25% liver left over. Your liver will regenerate from that and it will become a whole liver again. It is so like regenerative, okay? But if you are drinking alcohol, what does alcohol do? Your alcohol change into sugar and fat. And then fat is stored in the liver. So if you are drinking a lot of alcohol, that alcohol produces a lot of intermediate product which damage your liver cells and then deposit of the fat. So if you are early stage of effect of alcohol on your liver and you do ultrasonogram, you'll have sometimes pain abdomen and you can see a lot of fatty change in your liver. That's the time you have to stop drinking so that you can regenerate your liver. But if you continue drinking heavily, then those fat ultimately replace your cell and then your ultimately liver cells, each hepatocytes will be replaced by fibrous connective tissue. And that is called liver cirrhosis or liver fibrosis. And once you have cirrhosis or fibrosis, it is irreversible stage, you cannot regenerate your liver. In that case, you need transplant. So better if you find fatty changes, stop there. Okay, we talked about these things. So as I said earlier, the hepatic portal system, you see, this is the arterial blood in your intestine, stomach and intestine, and they become capillaries in the wall of your intestine, nutrients, and toxins are absorbed. This is the first capillary bed. Hepatic portal vein is bringing it, takes to the liver. In the liver, it becomes again capillaries, mixed with the hepatic artery, becomes sinusoids. And you see liver cells are taking these nutrients and metabolizing them. And then again, it passes blood to the central vein. Through the central vein, it goes to the hepatic vein and then to the inferior vena cava. Uh, liver also makes bile and then bile comes in the small intestine and bile is recycled again. See, some of the bile is absorbed again through the intestine, bile salts and recycled. Some passes through the intestine and absorb and go to your kidney that forms urobilinogen. Some turn into a stercobilin and that is in your stool that gives a lowest tinge to your, uh, the, the feces. That's why people who has the cirrhosis of the liver, their stool is whitish, not yellowish, because they lack 
the bile. Okay. Liver has several function. And you can see major categories of liver function. This is detoxification of blood, any toxins enters the liver, the copper cells and other chemical reaction. There are a lot of reaction inside the liver. They detoxify them. Carbohydrate metabolism, if you have a lot of glucose, then they make big chain of glucose, glycogen. If you have less, then they break down glycogen into glucose. They make fat from the glucose, cholesterol from the glucose. So lipid metabolism, synthesis of tri triglyceride and cholesterol, excretion of cholesterol, production of ketone bodies from the fatty acid, all are here. A lot of proteins like clotting factors, uh, albumin, uh, plasma transport proteins, they all are synthesized in your liver cells. It also makes bile salts, which is essential for digestion of fat. Now gallbladder and pancreas. So gallbladder only, stores the bile coming from your liver and it concentrate bile. That means gallbladder absorb most of the water from the bile and make it very thick. So even little amount of bile can work in the intestine because they are thick. Sometimes you have gallstone, which is called cholelithiasis. Cholelithiasis. Cholelithiasis is gallstone. Gallstone usually forms the nest here inside the gallbladder. And they usually stay there. As long as they are there, it does not cause any problem. But smaller pieces when passes, and here lodge into the cystic duct or common bile duct, then they cause problem. It causes back pressure in the gallbladder and then cause inflammation and that is called cholecystitis. If a small pieces come here in the duodenum papilla and lodge here, then what happens? It will not only block the gallbladder and liver, but will also block pancreatic duct. And then pancreatic enzymes in the pancreatic duct will back up and that will start digesting their own ducts and the pancreas and that is very dangerous. In that case, doctor has to intervene immediately and take out that stone from there. When we remove gallbladder, that is called cholecystectomy. Gallstone is common in female. So we call it 4FS, gallbladder. Common, uh, gallstone is common in female. And to remember, predisposing factor of gallbladder, uh, gallstone, predisposing. Gallstone. Our 4FS. The first F is female. If you are female, your chance is high. Second F is fat. If your body mass index is high, you have even further chance. Fertile, more the birth to the children, number of birth, more chance of gallstone. And then age of 40, older the age, higher the chance of gallstone. Okay, so when you have fatty food, this gallbladder contract and gallbladder contract, like when you get fatty food in your duodenum, then your small intestine wall produce some hormone called cholecystokinin. And that cholecystokinin goes into blood and then in the wall of gallbladder, and gallbladder to contract, and then it come into your duodenum to digest the fat. Pancreas is located behind the stomach. 
And pancreas is a mixed gland. That's why it has both endocrine and exocrine functions. So let's see the pancreas. This is the pancreas here. It is joined, connected to duodenal papilla through the main and accessory pancreatic duct. If you see the histology of pancreas, it has two kinds of structure. It has exocrine structure, which has ducts. You see the duct? That is called pancreatic acinus. This pancreatic acinus around here, which is 90% of the pancreas. These cells mix enzymes and through these ducts, ultimately pancreatic duct drain into the duodenum. But very few 10% are like patchy area on the pancreas. That is called pancreatic islets. They are like islands in the ocean. And it was found by Mr. Langerhan. So we call them islets of Langerhan. And it has two kinds of cell, alpha cell and beta cell. Alpha cell produce glucagon and beta cell produce insulin. Both hormone uh, play role in regulation of blood glucose. Insulin reduce blood glucose, glucagon increase blood glucose. Okay, so in histology, you can see this is the patch. This is islet of Langerhan. This is the endocrine portion and rest are exocrine portion, this portion. So what are the pancreatic juice? The pancreatic juice are water bicarbonate digestive enzymes and digestive enzyme in includes amylase for starch, trypsin for protein, lipase for part, uh, fats, and some breast border enzymes are also necessary for activation of trypsin and chymotrypsin. So trypsin release that trypsinogen, chymotrypsin release that chymotrypsinogen, and this is breast border enzymes which activate them. Not salivary glands, parotid, sublingual, and some mandibular produce also salivary amylase, which digest the starch. Digestion, absorption here, you see this is a starch. Starch is made up of glucose chain and then amylase, turn them into short oligosaccharide, maltriose and maltose. And then digestion and absorption of protein in the small intestine by these enzymes, enteropeptidase, trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, these all enzymes, and then they are absorbed from there. So how they absorbed? These Dipeptides and tripeptides, some amino acid and some di and tripeptides after digestion in the lumen of the small intestine, they enter either as amino acid or di and tripeptides. In the epithelial cells, there is enzymes, dipeptidase, tripeptidase enzyme, they break down them into amino acid. And then amino acid only enter the bloodstream. Absorption of lipid, as I said here, so here you go. When from your stomach, when fat droplets in the form of triglycerides is coming, then it mixed with the bile from the gallbladder and liver. See, fat is Water insoluble substance. So if this is large fat droplets, what happens? These fat droplets, if you don't put anything, these all fat droplet will attract it to each other because they are all lipophilic. So they will attract to each other and make a big clump of fat. And it will be hard for the enzymes to get inside the fat and digest them. So we bring the soap like compound, which is the, uh, the, the bile. bile. And that bile then emulsify the fat because they, the soap get around a small particle of the fat and mix them, emulsify them. And then lipase comes, so lipase will have access to each molecule. And then lipase secrete them in free fatty acid and monoglycerides. And then they are turned into micelles. And these dis uh, dissolving of fatty acid and monoglycerides into micelles to produce the mixed micelles, those micelles then here get into the cells and then resynthesize triglyceride by the enzymes in the epithelial cells. 
then they bind with the protein called chylomicrons. Chylomicrons are carried into the lymphatic duct. And then it's taken to the liver where they synthesize cholesterol or all lipoproteins. Okay. Okay, this is all, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Professor, I had a question. Uh-huh. Um, are you going to regrade the exams from last week? Um, or like all the fill-in yeah. questions? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and um, the outline for the non-infectious disease is due tonight, right? Yeah. I'm not sure if you ever got my email, but is scarlet fever okay for yeah. the non-infectious disease? Scarlet fever? Yeah. Okay, you can do it. Okay, all right, thank you.